Well, good morning, my very much loved brothers and sisters at South. And hello also to the many online people that uh, watch the videos these days uh, in these very strange COVID times. And thanks very much for that, uh, hope, that song that just preceded uh, the reading. Um, very well chosen, thank you. Um, do we think of our life in the Lord as being a life of joy? And that's the question for this morning. And I know personally with myself that I'd never given it much thought till quite recently. Because a few weeks ago I heard a talk from a brother from Auckland uh, in these strange COVID times. I just happened to be trolling around for an exhort and um, there was one that I listened to. His name is uh, Robert Prince. I don't know him, but I'd very much like to thank him very much for introducing me to the thought of joy as a subject. And much of the content of this uh, talk is based on what he had to say and I'm very much indebted to him and it very much moved me. And I guess the different personality types will focus uh, on different elements of life and for me perhaps joy wasn't uh, ever an inspiration, uh, an aspiration that I thought much about or being important as an element in Christ. And in our circles the idea of joy doesn't get much airplay. In fact, Hill Roberts' uh, talk that I heard, I don't think I'd ever heard a talk about joy before. Yet the words joy and joyful and rejoice and joyous and any other joy word that goes with that occurs 350 times, over 350 times in the Bible. And anyone who's ever done a word study before will know that if something appears 350 times, that's a lot. That's a real lot. So in God's eyes, joy must be really important. It's a simple word. And even without doing any kind of word study on it, most of us would have an idea what it means. It literally means to be happy or maybe to have great happiness. And if we try to uh, get more crunch out of it than that, Essentially, it means happiness that's a bit more long-term or subdued, perhaps, than just happy. Because there's places that you would use the word happy and there's places that you'd use the word joy and happy tends to be a bit more transitory and joy seems to be in a bit more of a fulfilled overall sense. So there's a very subtle difference, but they're basically the same idea. So you get word, joy used in words, uh, in phrases like, their sorrow turned to joy, or I can hardly express the joy I felt at seeing her again. So by contrast, if we were to compare this with a word like atonement perhaps, the word atonement only occurs 70 times. Atonement is a very complicated word. It's very hard for us, for most of us, including myself, to get a solid handle on it. Yet we would have all heard lots about atonement over the years. Magazine articles, Bible classes, Bible schools, talks, discussions, arguments and divisions. And all of these would far outweigh the amount of discussion we'd ever heard on joy. The atonement is important, we know. But according to the proportion of times the words are used in the Bible, joy should be way more dominant and way more important, you would think. Four times the amount of times that it appears in the Bible. And God tells us to have joy, but perhaps joy just seems too simple. It's so simple that we don't even need to talk about it. And instead we prefer to contend for the meanings of disputed words like atonement so that 
We can defend the truth against decay and we can argue endlessly over Bible verses and prove our versions of the meanings of those thoughts that we have and making ourselves miserable in the process. We focus on these complicated elements of faith and great tasks that are needed. But we lose the basics on the way. I remember Bob Lloyd years ago had a talk on being brilliant at the basics. And it's just like the spiritual leaders in Jesus' day. Joy is continually pushed into the cupboard and the door firmly locked. Does it really matter if we don't understand all the ins and outs of the atonement or other complicated words and issues? Perhaps not. Are we just trying to please God in our contending or in our deciphering of complex ideas while ignoring God's simple gospel requests such as have joy? Questions about joy might be, is it just a nice word? Is it just mentioned a lot by sheer fluke? Is it a commandment of God? Obviously it's not a real commandment like the other commandments. Are we actually told specifically that we have to have joy? Is joy just another thing that we have to add to our list of uh, growing things that we need to do? And really, should Christians even be getting joy out of living godly lives? Is that a thing that we need to even think about? I've heard that said before. Let's have a look at what God tells us about joy then, hey? Um, and firstly, the Old Testament. And you don't need to turn to these ones, but I'm going to read out four quick psalms. The first one is from our reading this morning. Um, so I'll just read them out. Psalm 98 verse 4, and all my readings today are from the ESV. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody. Make a joyful noise, noise to the Lord, all the earth. So, and this is Psalm 100. Serve the Lord with gladness which is another joy word. Shout for joy in the Lord, O ye righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Shout. And Psalm, that was Psalm 33. Psalm 32 says, Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. So that last one, Psalm 32, has three joy words in it. So all of those joy words in those four passages I've just read out, they're all similar to each other and there's many more. So being so impressed by Robert's talk as I was, I spoke to someone about this recently, a brother. I was so excited with the importance of joy in our walk and how we never talk about it and yet it's so important and they said in a very deadpan voice yeah but it depends on what the word joy really means in the bible and that was the end of the conversation this was proof positive to me that we just love complicating things we love it without just doing the simple things that god wants us to do So I'm probably speaking to the uh, converted here already, but for those people who do like word meanings from the Bible before we get too excited, um, the four Psalms that I read, I will just read out what those four words are. And it's a little bit like the song we just sang. The first one, be glad, is to brighten up, to be gleesome, to be joyful, to cheer up. The second one, rejoice, is to spin around under the influence of any violent emotion. 
Sounds like us, doesn't it? <laughs> Usually rejoicing. That's what it means. Shout for joy. We heard that a few times. It means to split the ear with sound. That's how loud that is. To shout for joy. And the last one, aloud for joy. Joyfully to sing. To rejoice. So there's four very different words from very four different verses describing the very different ways that we can have joy. But they're not passive words, are they? They're not passive thoughts who we just, you know, smile and wave, we just sit here with our joy. They are joy in action, words. We're being told that we need to be living with joy to the Lord being glad and rejoicing and shouting and singing and dancing and music, bursting with jubilant song. So when was the last time our joy overflowed that much? That it just burst out of us. Psalms and many, many other passages tell us that God wants this joy from us, this kind of joy. And this is the supposedly harsh Old Testament we're looking at. What about the New Testament? What does that say under Jesus? Again, three quick passages from Paul. You can just listen to these. Romans 12 says, Rejoice in hope. Philippians 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, Rejoice. Twice, Paul repeats that there. First Thessalonians 5, verse 15 to 18, and I'll read this section out. As a, there's a few things I want to bring out of this. Verse 15 says, See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ for you. So, word time. In the New Testament, uh, Greek, the words here in uh, these three passages from Paul are the same word, and it's the word cheerful. And calmly, happy, or well off, or be well, be glad, rejoice. But the lesson, I guess, more than that is that God doesn't say be miserable always. God wants us to be happy and not just happy from time to time. He wants us to be happy always, which is a long time. Over a long time, God is wanting us to have a lifetime full of joy. So is this just something nice to do? Is it a non-negotiable sort of instruction, a suggestion, or is it a commandment? Well, looking around that passage, that same passage from 1st of Thessalonians, we know that not paying back evil for evil is non-negotiable. It's a commandment, isn't it? We're not to do it. And Jesus explained that in the Sermon on the Mount. We also know that being kind and loving your enemies is also something that we have to do and is non-negotiable. So in the same way, in the same context, right between those things, we have an instruction to be joyful. To be joyful always is equally as important as not repaying evil for evil, as being kind, as praying continually, as giving thanks This is God's will for us in Christ Jesus. It's a commandment, isn't it? It's more than a suggestion. Cheerful, rejoice, be glad, have joy, be joyful. Do these words describe you? Do they describe me? As an individual, as a person... 
So they describe us as a group, as a community of people that are in the world to spread the gospel. Joy must be pretty high on our list of things that we must do for God. And you might say, well, rejoicing is all very well when things are going well. We all know that feeling. Bursting into song, giving thanks for your hope, shouting for joy are quite easy when life is good. But the commandments about rejoicing don't only apply when life is good. Rejoicing is a commandment even when things go pear-shaped. We're to do it always, even in the face of persecution. Our Lord said in Matthew 5, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you, falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So rejoice here is that same word. To be uh, cheerful. In persecution. In hard times. But the word glad that Jesus uses there in verse 12 of Matthew 5 is a very unusual word. And it doesn't mean to just be cheerful. It means to jump for joy. Exalt, be exceeding glad with exceeding joy and rejoice greatly. Wow, (laughs) that's a bit hard, isn't it? Persecution, insults, evil, hurt, pain, hard times are all things that are going to make us feel terrible, aren't they? But here, Jesus' command is, in black and white, to jump for joy at these times. In the darkest of times. Even as Christ was walking through the valley of the shadow of death, he knew his death was coming. Jump for joy. It's a bit like the tennis, yes! And to be honest, I'm not that kind of personality. <laughs> I find that hard. Uh, other people might be able to do that well. To be doing a Toyota ad when you're getting persecuted. I guess most of us really have to work on that, hey? Another New Testament quote that reinforces Jesus' thoughts here about rejoicing in hard times is James 1 and verse 2. Counter all joy, my fellows, when you meet trials of various kinds. Count it all joy. Not just a little bit, it's all joy. And I guess we have to choose joy, don't we? It might have to be a a choice that we make. Like Paul and Silas in the prison. They were singing songs in praise to God. You can hardly believe that story, can you? But it's what they chose to do. And because of that, somebody else was saved. So this is something we have to learn in our lives. We have to learn to count all joy. So God hasn't given us these commandments to just give us another unattainable thing that we have to do in life. They're commandments with a difference. This is a commandment to have joy, to make our lives easier, to make our lives more fun, to reduce our burdens and our heartache, and to make us more like Jesus Christ. We've just considered nine verses, and if they are the only nine times in the Bible God tells us to rejoice, that would be enough, wouldn't it? Because it's pretty 
extensive what we've just read. But the commandment to, to rejoice and to have joy is repeated in the Bible more than nearly every other commandment. 350 times. And we understand it. We know what it means. We just need to do it. But we don't give joy the attention that it deserves. Paul tells us in Galatians 5, in the section on the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. I didn't even know it was there till I looked it up. <laughs> I probably did, but it's one of those words you just gloss over. And if somebody said, what are the seven aspects of the fruit of the Spirit, I, joy would probably have not come to mind. It's a spiritual discipline. It's a fruit of the Spirit that we need to develop in our lives. If we are living the way Jesus wants us to live, then our joy must be growing and blossoming. These fruits are godly attributes, we have to remember. Godliness is happiness. Wow. So God must be full of joy too, if he's instructing us to have that. And nearly all the parts of the fruit of the Spirit are taken really seriously. But joy, we just overlook. We don't even see that it's there. And we need to develop and cultivate that in our lives, in all parts of our lives, everywhere we go, what we do at home. We also need to help each other to have joy. In Paul's letter to the Philippians, there is an extreme amount of joy. Paul mentions it many times in Philippians. I'll just choose four spots out of Philippians, just so I'll just read them quickly. Chapter 1, he says, I thank my God in all remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy. And this is an odd phrase, isn't it? He's making prayer for others with joy. It sort of it almost doesn't make sense, but the joy is in the prayer for others. He joys in that. Later in Philippians 1, he says, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. And yes, I will rejoice in Christ. Later in Philippians 1, he says, Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. He was wanting to help them with their progress and their joy in the faith. So Paul was a joy spreader. One of his aims in life was to infect other people with joy. And that should be our aim as well. We need that. When we meet with other people, we need to be joy spreaders, pointing each other to Christ and the joy that we have in him. There was a brother I knew years ago that every time I spoke to... <laughs> there's probably several people now that I think of it, but one brother stands out because every time I spoke to him, how are you going? He'd go, oh, not bad behind the eight ball. Every conversation started that way. In the end, I didn't ask him how he was going because I knew what the answer would be. I just said, hi. <laughs> didn't allow that to come in. No way. Um, not that we should turn people away, of course. Um, the, 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 the lesson is there's a, there's a phrase uh, that we can be bucket fillers or we can be bucket emptiers and everyone's got a bucket of joy and we can be filling that up for them or we can be sucking it out. And of all the people in this earth, we don't want to be those ones that are sucking people dry of their joy. We want to be filling up their buckets so that they walk away with full buckets. And Paul was like that. 
And he wanted them, the Philippians, to share that joy too. In chapter 2 he says, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort of love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. He wanted the joy that he had and the joy spreading that he had to be spread from them to the rest of the Philippi area. So joy is very important. In old times it was so important to God that he set aside times in Israel that were specially designed to create joy. The people were given given weekly Sabbaths, days of rest and rejoicing in God's goodness. That's what they were for every Saturday. Stop from everything else and count the joy. There were three weeks of feasting and holidays, joyful celebrations of thanksgiving to the Lord, the provisions and the harvests. Compared to only one day of mourning, the day of atonement was the day of mourning. But instead of joyfulness, Israel's service became rituals and sacrifice and done grudgingly obeying the letter rather than obeying the spirit of joy. And this joyless spirit so repulsed God that in the times of the Israelites, God sent them off to another land to learn a lesson. In the times of Christ, he condemned the religious leaders for being dens of vipers. So what about us? Are we serving God joyfully and gladly? right where we are in our lives. We might be thinking, aren't we supposed to bear our afflictions, endure, fight to the end, persevere under trial, repent, confess and carry our cross? Well, there's certainly times like that, isn't there? But even in those times can be joy. Joy. Hebrews tells us to look at Jesus in this. Hebrews 12 says, Therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every way and sin which clings so closely to us and let us run with endurance the races set before us. So yes, there's those things that we're doing. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for what? The joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame and is seated at the right hand of God. For the joy that was set before him, Jesus very literally carried his cross from the city to the place of his crucifixion. That can't have been a happy time at all. But Jesus' walk with the cross was motivated with joy. He knew what was ahead. And it's that same joy that is set before us. All of us have got that same joy to look forward to. So joy is a commandment, but it's a pleasurable one. A commandment that we humans all too quickly forget. A commandment that we take too lightly. And yet joy is more than a commandment. It's an invitation to enter into the spirit and joy of our Lord. What does joy look like, do you think? Perhaps a mother with a brand new baby, as Jesus describes in John 16, after the pain has finished, she remembers it no more for the joy of the birth. The shepherd who finds the sheep that was lost a bride or groom on their wedding day. They don't just have joy that's tucked away deeply inside. They're not rejoicing on the inside and looking miserable on the outside. They're behind the eight ball. Their joy overflows. It shows in their faces, in their actions, in their words. That's the sort of joy that we need to be able to show from the inside out. 
to be thankful, to burst into song, to make music, to be enthusiastic, to shout, to encourage others, to dance, to be united, to celebrate, to express gratitude is all part of what joy looks like to God. God offers us joy that has and will always bring us healing and love through the salvation of Jesus. So brothers and sisters and others, we need to try real hard to show that joy in our lives to everyone we meet and let our faces glow with that joy. Joy may very well be the hardest commandment that God has given us to do. And yet we have to do it.